Cédric Arnaud is a kind of poetic image storyteller. Time, memory and self-narration are recurring themes in his works. Let's emerge in these stunning images and perceptions about the Asian culture through his lens. I'm Julie Vexel. Welcome to the SIAC Talks Bangkok. My approach does come from my documentary background. And I take it almost as a documentary project, but then start developing more uh, ideas that are more connected to, I suppose, uh, contemporary art and contemporary art uh, process. But the research process is very much like a photojournalist research process. Yeah. And then I start finding ideas and deciding what kind of uh, technique I might use and with all this chemistry, chemical process that I use and, and all, all these kind of things and layering images in different ways. That sort of comes once I've defined the boundaries of the project and I know what I want to be working on, then I decide how I'm going to work on it based on the ideas. So if I, I use a technique that's always connected to the ideas, I don't, I don't force a technique on an idea. Uh, how the digital technology has been impacting your work? Well, in terms of shooting for magazines and, and all sorts of other clients, it's since, I'd say, 2003, four, five. maybe you could stretch it to six for some people, but I'd say from 2005, it was impossible to not shoot digital for clients. Like, you couldn't impose mm -hmm. film on anybody anymore. So it just became the norm, the new norm. But for my personal work, I, to this day, still use uh, analog. How was Apophenia conceived, for example? <laughs> uh, Almost by accident. Can you say a conscious accident? I don't know. It's a, so basically what happened, it was at the beginning of the pandemic, at the very, very beginning of the pandemic, when we still didn't know how serious it was going to be, that I started working on this. Um, I was looking through a lot of my archives and I found this old box of negatives that was marked uh, throwaway question mark. <laughs> from my first years, in the first couple of years in Thailand when I was shooting a lot of the news. So that's 20 years ago. And there was all sorts of random stuff in there. And I thought, you can't throw away negatives. I made a, a, a new box and I, 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 historical archives or whatever, personal historical archives, and I just put all that stuff in there. And, okay, I'll deal with that later. And then I started finding all sorts of other stuff. I'm like, I'm not going to keep that. I had already in the past developed several techniques of putting chemistry directly on negatives. And this time I took it much further. I started experimenting with all sorts of crazy cocktails of different acids and chemicals, always wearing a mask and, and opening the windows and, and just trying different things. And eventually um, I went, wow, this is actually quite interesting. Um, and I got quite obsessed with trying to find patterns in there. And I remember having a conversation with my friend, uh, Jeff, and uh, he said, well, actually, we're, do you want to be part of this group show that we're doing? And it's going to be based on the concept of apophenia. And I'm like, oh, yeah, apophenia, that thing where people see patterns everywhere that might and not exist. Yeah, I'm like, too. okay, that's great. And I asked him, I said, do you, what do you think if I call my project apophenyac? which is not a, a word for apophenia. But, but it doesn't actually exist in the dictionary, apophenyac. 
So it's like mm -hmm. a it's like, an, it's, it's like a condition that doesn't exist, but to suffer from apophenia in an extreme manner can happen, and people get of really course. obsessed, including yeah, yeah. conspiracy theorists and all sorts of people who searching meaning see in, everywhere. Exactly, who mm -hmm. are obsessed with finding patterns and meaning. Yeah, and I thought, well, that's interesting. And as it as it developed more and more, when I started making a film out of it, I suddenly realized that. Uh, again, having another conversation with Jeff, and I didn't, I didn't uh, at the time realize how important that might be, and I'm realizing a lot more now. He said, you know what's very interesting about Apophenyak is that the images are made completely organically. However, they look like they could have been made by AI or again. And I went, I was almost offended at the beginning, <laughs> At because I time. work, because I always work in my personal work very organically and, and with using my hands and chemicals and everything. So I think, you know, well, no, that's the, it's like the opposite of the. And I then I started going. Actually, no, he's right. That's really what makes it interesting because of this convergence of digital and analog in our lives every day. And now, especially now, with generative AI, and we do not know well. For the moment, the we, can, we can recognize we can recognize what's made by AI and what's not. But in the next few years, we won't. We'll of have course. to use special software. We'll have to use like forensic tools, digital forensic tools, to find out. You know. So it started. It got me thinking on this. And now Apophenyak is growing into a much bigger project, where there's chapter two, chapter three, which are investigating that aspect of things a lot more. It's anti-photojournalistic almost <laughs> because it's it my my life before uh, working on Apophenyak as 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 a as an image maker was always defined by this uh, decisive moment where you have to get the shot. You have an editor breathing down your neck telling you, "Did you get that that shot that we need?" Uh, you know, um, so you have to get the moment. And this approach with the reality. Mm -hmm. Well, it also got me thinking about Suzanne Zontag and, 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 and various uh, such thinkers and John Burge and everybody else, because you think about the idea of the reality of, uh, in photography, and actually, if you think deeply about it, there's no such thing. Because I could frame you like this or like that. I could capture you at a moment where you're, you have like a distant thought, which could be anything. It might not be a negative thought, but it looks like it could be negative on your face. And then I could caption saying, you know, Julie is angry or whatever. But um, which it, it can be very deceiving and not just with the words, just with the, with the way of framing. If you include a group of people, but not one specific person that's cut out of the frame, that can it's have a meaning, etc. Et et the the list chance. goes on and Zontag does talk about that quite a lot in her writing. So Apophenyak in a way sort of got me back to those roots and I started reading Roland Barthes and all, all, the, all the people who wrote about photography and then went back into reinvestigating the work of Chris Marker and Le Jeté and all these things. And, and I just, uh, it, was, it was a very good trigger point for me to investigate and rethink image making. In almost a, how could I describe it? a post-documentary, if that makes any, any sense. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's where I am right now. I mm -hmm. still use a documentary approach in my research, but I guess what I'm making is more post-documentary. It's a, a blend of, of several things. Um, and yeah, that's, that was the trigger point. Like I said, a tiny little spark, a box of negatives that I thought were useless, just mm -hmm. turned into something. And now it's just growing and growing and growing. I've got so, so perceiving another uh, possibilities yeah, yeah, yeah. to cross the visual yeah. art with photography. And I, and I have a huge like, archive uh, of, yeah. of, of old negatives and material that I can use as well. And I started using that process with old film reels as well. So I'm, I've just got... Are you working in some project now, right now? Uh, well, I, the Apophenyak is growing into, into a much, much bigger project. That's, that's uh, and with several chapters. And also, I'm going to be carrying on with uh, my shaman as my therapist as well. That exactly, one. it was yeah. my next question. Mm -hmm.
The original idea uh, for the first film was to do a new film based on this tattoo master that I had already worked with quite a lot. But I, the people who commissioned the, who commissioned the, the film or who helped to finance the film, I, I actually told them, I don't want to just do a documentary about Thai tattoos again, because I've already done that. What I want to do, especially because I'm filming during the pandemic, I want to try and see the reasons or investigate the reasons why people decide to go to a shaman or a tattoo master or guru or even a, a fortune teller. And he will be chapter one of a series. And that's what it became. So for the first six minutes of a 24 minute film, you don't see a tattoo needle. <laughs> and that's not me trolling people or anything. It's more because the point of the film this time is to try and find, because people might go to him like they might go to a healer or a Brahmin priest or some, depending on, on, on their needs. And more like a spiritual cocktail where people here and in other places in, in Asia and Southeast Asia will take various elements from different belief systems and blend them together and sort of shake them up and create their own personal sort of, again, I wouldn't say religion, like belief system or, or, or set of rules for life or whatever you want to call it. And I've observed this so many times amongst my friends, amongst people I, I interviewed and photographed and filmed, etc. And that's basically the genesis of that project is to try and take it into a much more modern era as well. I don't want to focus just on the tr traditional approach of things because there are many young people who are reappropriating uh, belief systems and turning them into, into all sorts of interesting things. It could be put in the category of placebo. I, I've seen quite a lot of interesting things over the years covering the, this sort of, uh, filming this sort of thing, the, these different rituals. And I've seen multiple times people walk into uh, a shaman's place and be like very sort of, you know, their shoulders are slumped and they're very um, looking around worried and stressed. And there's this ceremony, there's this prayer, and then they leave completely. Indifferent. And I don't see that probably because of my Western, more Cartesian background, sort of, I don't necessarily see it as, oh, it's magic. I see it more as this person went in there deciding that this shaman, this tattoo master, whoever can help and is the service that he provides is to allow me to delegate my problems and just Instant. and move on with my life instead of taking a Western approach of self-flagellation and, <laughs> <laughs> and Christian guilds and all that stuff, you know? So that's what the aspect that really fascinates me in many ways is that, is this ability to just go, okay, give this to the fortune teller, give this to this, to, to this person, to whatever, and just move on with your life instead of, you know, um, you know just obsessing over a mistake or, or, or feeling guilty or, or whatever. So that fascinates me also Really what fascinates me is sometimes the altered states of consciousness that people get into, states of trance, uh, which to my knowledge, at least I haven't seen anybody, you know, take any substances, um, but I've seen pretty strange things happen. And that also interests me. Is it, again, some sort of sense of belonging to a group that triggers that? Is it something else? Is it is it the absolute... Uh, a very strong need to believe in something. All of these things absolutely fascinate me, but not in a sort of exotic and strange manner. There's no, I mean, I've lived here 20 years. I see it around me all the time. Um, it's, part, it's part of life. So that's what fascinates me here is how it's evolving. And that's what I wanted to keep on documenting. I don't, I don't want to show just the weirdness of, you know, look at these strange things that are happening in Thailand because that, that's, you know, there's plenty of, foreign journalists who come to Thailand for a month to do something like that, it would be useless for me to provide that and also quite disrespectful, to be honest. Okay. Um, so I, I prefer to uh, take my time, which is why that project is very slow. <laughs> the first part was launched at the National Gallery in 
the summer of 2022 and I'm working on, on the next part now and I'm hoping to expand it to the whole of, whole of Asia. Yantra was uh, a project that I started working on quite a long time ago, in 2008. At the time, it was uh, based on an encounter that I had had with a very interesting shipyard worker. Wow, this guy is next level. He's absolutely covered and he's got all these geckos on him and he's just... Where, where does that come from? Why does he feel the need for this? Why, why so much? Is it something like once you start, you can't stop? Like how, how, how does it work? Does he have an obsessive character? I started getting interested in all these different people to try and find out who they were. The project grew from shooting uh, square format six by six uh, with a, an old Roliflex camera on a white background that I would take with me to a large format camera, you know, the big cameras where you sort of go under a black cloth and you focus manually and you have a glass plate and, and all of that. Then I realized actually what really fascinates me in this is, is the state of trance. And I thought, well, then I'm gonna have to make a film. And that's how I made my first film, which was about the trance um, states that the different devotees enter where they mimic the uh, creatures that are tattooed on, on them. You are an uh, European immigrant in Asia. Mm -hmm. So how does living here uh, impact your lens as a filmmaker, as a visual artist, a photographer? Um, the way that it impacts me is kind of interesting because when I first moved to Asia, I knew of one Asian filmmaker, and you know who that is. It's Wong Kar Wai, of course, because in the 90s, in the, in, the, in, the, in the mid 90s to the late 90s, he was the coolest filmmaker and Christopher Doyle, the coolest director of photography. Uh, it influenced massive attacks, video clips and Portishead and all the coolest bands at the time. So the, that Hong Kong scene from then was the thing that people knew. But I confess I knew almost nothing else. Kurosawa and a few other classics, of course, but that's about it. Um, but when I moved here, of course, I discovered Api Chapong and I, I, uh, I discovered through Api Chapong because he mentioned him many times, uh, Tsai Ming Liang from, uh, from Taiwan and uh, films such as uh, Goodbye Dragon Inn, which have a, all of these films have a narrative sort of approach, which is kind of non-linear. It certainly doesn't follow the Hollywood three act system. Uh, or it very often also doesn't involve a character which must overcome something and then become a changed individual or a better individual, which is a kind of a, an American slash Hollywood obsession. Sometimes characters in Asian films don't change whatsoever. <laughs> uh, the happy ending thing has been obliterated by some Korean filmmakers, as we know, with the revenge movies, where the ending is not exactly <laughs> happy. So I, I started getting very interested in all of that, and I guess it had sort of indirectly an influence on how I approach, how I approach things and how I see things, and that influences me quite a lot. Uh, when I um, I made a project called uh, Not There, which, uh, exactly. which, which, and, and this project uh, I shot it during the pandemic. So a lot of empty streets and things like this, but uh, it's absolutely undeniable that I was hugely influenced by all of the night scenes from uh, movies like Goodbye Dragon Inn, etc. You know, just putting the camera on a tripod and doing very slow movements, um, just taking my time. And there was nothing else to do because 
with my journalist card, I was able to go out after curfew and I took a tripod and put it there or maybe sometimes a small dolly track and just do a little movement in the side streets. Uh, I even took several trips on expressways where I, I filmed the empty expressways. Um, but it was all with that, I suppose subconsciously, that influence of this sort of slow, non-linear Asian cinema. It's an ambience more than a story, but a story that tells itself through the editing, because I also covered some of the political protests and a lot of things happened in, in, in 2020 and 2021 in, in Thailand. So um, there was a lot of that interjected into the, into the footage and it just created its own narrative. It's, it's a, there's no need for anything. I remember when I screened it, a lot of people said, oh, wow, you really captured the, that time. Uh, I wish I had gone out and done the say, uh, something similar. And, and, and I, I was very moved by what was happening with, uh, with the pandemic. Uh, it was causing all sorts of strange things uh, to happen, obviously division, change, etc. And not there is, so it's, it's spelled so N-O-T, not, and then there, the T uh, is in brackets because it's not there and not here neither here nor there, which was also an expression on the fact that, which goes back to the idea of being an immigrant. I've been here 20 years, and when I go back to Europe, I always feel a little bit strange. What uh, was uh, your intention with the not, uh, uh, not there uh, at the beginning? Like most of my projects, it's connected to, it's connected to memory and, 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 and uh, self-narration and how, as humans, we have this unique ability to tell our own stories. We tell ourselves our own story all the time. And that's what I suppose difficult to prove exactly if that's what makes us conscious, but at least that's what makes us different to animals um, in that sense. Um, let's not argue about animal consciousness or anything like that right now, because I, I suppose there is something there. But what I, what I mean is that this unique ability, at least as far as we know, uh, we're the only species that can do that. We sort of tell ourselves our own story. And when you tell yourself your own story, and it's this sort of split story, which is between two cultures, and most of your adult life has been lived in a place that is not yours, or not where you actually grew up, um, it can become, uh, I don't know if confusing is the word, because I feel very comfortable here, but it's more, um, there's a lot of questions that you ask yourself. Also with the, the shifting of, uh, of ideas and a much stronger influence of Asia and Asian culture and Asian visuals and everything on Western culture. We're seeing it a lot with an increasing number of very interesting Asian artists that get a lot more attention in the West now as well. So there's all this sort of shifting thing and sometimes obviously you wonder like where do I fit in all of this? What's the story? Where, where do I fit? So I guess that project was kind of an investigation into that. So it's not just about me, it's about anybody who might find themselves in, in a situation like this, whether Western or Asian or African or from anywhere. But it can happen quite easily uh, to feel somewhat displaced and not knowing exactly where, where you belong. But it is really about self-narration. Looking behind your trajectory um, as a photographer, filmmaker, photojournalist, uh, mm -hmm. visual artist, uh, if you could have a talk with the, the young Cedric, uh, what would you say to him? I would say to young Cedric, I would say uh, embrace your creativity as early as possible because I blocked that for quite a long time. Because you yeah. see, when I, when I, yeah, when I graduated from, uh, from uh, high school, I wanted to go into art school, but I wasn't selected. And I tried to apply for the best ones in Paris, which was probably, in retrospect, now when I see my old sketches and drawings and, and paintings from back then, I kind of understand why <laughs> I wasn't accepted. But, I guess there was an element of me when I went into journalism that was kind of like uh, a revenge against, against the art world. 
but deep down it's really what I, what I was. And now I, I'm accepting that much later in life. So that's what I would do. I would say like, you know, now even, you even, are expressing. Even, even if you had, if have setbacks or you're not accepted or whatever, keep, keep creating. I mean, it's, it's not like I didn't create. Photography is a creative process. But, but in terms of like thinking about art projects and that just, that just died instantly. I just went, I was very radical when I was, when I was a kid. I went, okay, fine, I'll do something else. I just completely blocked it. And, and it was creeping up on me all these years. They, that's why I probably always felt a little bit weird as a photojournalist because I was, well, there must be a better way to do this. There must be a more creative way to approach this. And, and, and it sort of, it took its time to, uh, to develop. But yeah, that, that's, that's where that came from, for sure. Abs yeah. And I would absolutely do say that to young Cedric. It's like, don't listen if people say you're crap. It doesn't matter, you can still create, even if you are actually crap, because eventually you might become good. <laughs> Just keep creating, that's what I would say. And that's what I say to my students, to my students who are really passionate about, about certain uh, uh, creative aspects, but they get frustrated because I show them my work and my colleagues' work and other work, and I go, oh, well, I'll never be able to do that. I'll be like, of course you will. Just keep trying. When I feel a bit stuck with something, I go, well, just trust the process, keep going, keep going, keep going. And eventually, out of chance, and that's, a, that's typical of Apophiniac, because some, some days when I'm sort of melting negatives and doing stuff, I just get nothing. It's just like, it's very frustrating. So, you know, I, and, and, I, and I'm someone who likes to sort of go, oh, today it would be nice if I could get like two good images or something, or one good image, because last week I was too busy or whatever. And that's a ridiculous way to think when you're using chemistry and you, you can't control it. So you just have to just keep doing it, keep doing it. And eventually something really nice comes out. Instead to focus on the outcome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, embracing the process. Although the chemical process for everything is not, it's not that pleasant, I have to say. I have to wear a mask and gloves and everything and, and just okay. make sure. It was something new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very nice to, to have something tangible, palp palpable that you can, you can mm -hmm. sort of physically uh, work with because in the digital era, we just spend all our time on screens. What the artist Cedric wants for the future? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, to give people interesting experiences, uh, quite immersive and but but physical experiences. I don't want them to be too virtual. I want people to be to walk into a room, to hear the echo, of their footsteps, to feel things, hear things, and, 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 and I want to be able to use technology in ways where the physicality of, of, of the experience is enhanced by technology, not, um, oh, you can do this at home. Just give people an experience, transport people somewhere. Sensorial experience. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I believe there are so many more new tools that exist that that's really Uh, it fits very much my, my character, my sensibilities to approach things like this. I'm not someone who, even though I do think a lot about, about my projects and I write a lot about my projects, I do not want to be too conceptual about things um, in the sense that you, know, you might go to a gallery and you see an artwork and if you don't read the artist's statement, you cannot understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's fine, that's one approach, but it's not me. Because I'm quite interested in educational projects as well. Quite interested in something immersive for kids, maybe about the human brain, how it works, and things like this. I'd love to be part of projects like, like that. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it could be anything from something educational to something very profound, uh, mm -hmm. about death, about whatever. It depends, you know, it really depends on the, on the project. But I, I want to collaborate with scientists for sure. Mm -hmm.